dirty, dirt under the fingernails engineering company. They do a lot of drilling, a lot of really, you know, fundamental engineering work. And back in the past, they actually acquired a consulting company, Franklin and Andrews, which did a lot more consulting. So they're really a, a, a really good mix of hardcore engineering with consultancy around program controls. I've been brought into Mount McDonald to act as a subject matter expert on program controls across most of the industries. My background is uh, recently I was with BAA uh, Infrastructure as program control manager. Before that, Talus Aerospace. Uh, before that, BAE, uh, Naval Engineering. And before that, uh, United States Software Engineering. So I've kind of done the rounds. And I picked up a few things along the way. What I'm going to talk to you today about is a subject near and dear to my heart. And I actually have a gentleman here that I, I had a conversation with about it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to talk to you, and I, I've named this uh, Mind the Gap, the space between process and tool set. What I've been doing is I've been going around to most of the companies that Mark McDonald dealed with, and I've been using this thing called the maturity matrix. You're probably going to hear about this because it's a big sort of buzzword in the industry at the moment. Uh, the MOD is quite enamored with it. And I think they call it P3M3, which stands for Portfolio, Program, Project, and of course the three M's are the management sections of it. And what they're seeking to do is they're saying you should be comparing yourself not against yourself, you should be comparing yourself against best practice across other industries as laid down and fundamental to APM. So when you go into a company, the first thing I do with one of my clients is I run what I call the maturity matrix. The maturity matrix breaks down the program control aspects into 25 discrete functions. And what you're looking at here, and one of the things I can promise you that I'll try to do as we go along, is this is a composite now of about three major companies that I've run the maturity matrix with. I won't tell you who they are because of the scores, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. But what I intend to do is I intend to keep this model going for as long as I can, so that hopefully by the year's end, and if you invite me to do this next year, I will have 20, 30, 40 major companies in the UK analyzed across the 25 major functions, not compared to what they think is good, but what APM says is good. So let me just take you through where we're at right now. And I'm just gonna pick out a few of these. What you're seeing here, uh, zero in the middle doesn't actually exist. I've given actually one or two people a zero because they actually don't do that function. But you actually have a one to five. One meaning that you have a foundation and five meaning that you've optimized that function. In all cases, what optimization means in any function is that I'm doing it, I'm analyzing what I'm doing, and then I'm feeding back what I've learned back into what I'm doing. I call it a closed lock loop. In all cases, what they've decided is that's optimization. Optimization is you're learning from everything you do and you're feeding that back in each time you learn. That's the, that's the nirvana for program controls. Unfortunately, what you can see here is we're currently running at about 2.0, which means foundation. So if, I was, if you were a two, and let me just take one, say in change control, what that means is I probably have a procedure for change control. I've written a lot of stuff about it. I have a kind of log around change control. I maybe put it in the minutes of a meeting. But if I said to the, to the customer, show me the changes on this baseline for the last six months and why you did each change. You would be surprised how many companies cannot do that. But they will claim to do change control. And then I explain to them that's the whole point of change control, is being able to go back and show your baseline changes. The fact that you can't do that means that you're probably spending a lot of time and money and not achieving any benefit. So I'll show you here the definitions. So one being a foundation, and essentially it just means I have a concept of what it is I'm supposed to be doing in that function. 
Two means that you have a basic and you've established some basic controls, but you're probably not repeating that control to any degree of competency. So I might do it on one project, I might be able to do some changes, I maybe do the stakeholder changes, but I have no way of tracking program changes, that kind of thing. This is where most people sit, establish a process and a tool set, and this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. And the reason tool set is in there, and I'm gonna come back to this and, and hold me to it, I'm gonna tie those two together. My view is you cannot progress beyond a two and your program controls maturity without a tool set. And I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna prove that hopefully by the end. If you do not have a tool set that actually implements your process, you will probably be stuck at two forever because you have no repeatability. Your repeatability and your quality of producing the output of that function is solely dependent on the person that does it. And if he's having a bad day, your billion pound company change program is having a bad day. If your plan is sick with a cold at a crucial time that you're reaching a milestone, the whole thing is thrown in jeopardy. That means you actually don't have a system. It means you have a personality. Your system is based on people and not repeatability. Can you imagine if Ford built cars that way? So if Joe was at work, you buy a car. If Jim was at work, you wait till Joe comes back. No company does business that way, but you'll find a lot of program controls do business just that way especially when it comes to planners. So, I'm making the point that you'll never get past three unless you actually integrate the process to the tool set, and we're gonna talk about that a bit more. Once you do that, you then go into what I call the mature. And being mature means, again, the primary definition is your repeatability. It means that actually, as a company, it doesn't mean you're the best, because I'll, I'll throw this out there. You don't strive to be the best in everything. It's a nice thing, but it doesn't actually have to happen. The people that are the best are the best because they're repeatedly able to do something to a known quality. And it sounds funny, but in engineering, people don't want an indestructible toothbrush. They just want a good toothbrush for as long as they want to use it for the money that they're paying for it. They don't want a platinum toothbrush that costs 4,000 pounds. And that's the point. The point is, once you become mature, you're able to repeat to a certain level of, of, of quality everything you do. And of course, optimum, as I just described, optimum means that not only are you repeating that, but you're learning from that re repetition, and then you're feeding that repetition back in to the very start. And, and the buzzword for that, of course, is constant improvement. So that's what the maturity matrix seeks, uh, seeks to do. It seeks to take you through sponsorship of your program, project level authorization, work definition, material management, basis for estimating, supplier budget integration, schedule construction and content, data integrity, risk and opportunity, baseline change management, customer involvement, EVM as a decision making tool. Just reeling those off, some of you probably think I already failed. And when you come to do the maturity matrix, each one of these have a corresponding one through five definition that tells you what it is. And what I tell my clients when I'm doing the maturity matrix is, it's not Patrick Kennison's way of doing something, it's a standard, and what I'm going to do, and I call it depersonalizing it, what I do is I take what you do and I roll it across the one to five, and where the ball drops is where you fit in the maturity matrix. I find this particularly useful if you're trying to get someone to change the way that they're doing whatever they're doing, because what they'll essentially want to do as soon as you come into the company is say, oh, well, Patrick, we're pretty good at change control, or we're pretty good at scheduling, and I'll say to them, how do you know? Other than you saying you're pretty good, how do you know you're pretty good? Well, uh, nobody's come to my door with, wanting to shoot me. Therefore, I think it's happening. And well, the first thing I say to them is, well, let me come in, compare you against a maturity matrix, and let's see how good you are. Because it's kind of like a doctor. If you go to the doctor and you say, I've got a fever, and I think it's malaria. And I know some people actually do do that. But 
that's the way I kind of feel when people come to me with program control problems. They'll say, Patrick, I can't control my scope. That's the problem. I want you to fix it. And I say, well, are you sure you, that's the problem? Or is it because you actually don't do statements of work, so you actually don't even know what your scope is by the time you start? And maybe what you're seeing in not being able to control your scope is the fact that you've never properly defined your scope to begin with. So the idea is I try to take them back so I can find the real problem rather than what they think the problem is. And I really advocate using this mechanism as a way to depersonalize that whole idea. Take them through the matrix, roll the evidence across the, the holes within the maturity matrix, and where it falls is where you are. It's nothing to do with you. It's not a personal uh, uh, opinion. It's against a known standard. So that's pretty dismal. The first time I did this with a highly paid consultancy company that I was with in BAA, when I came up with a 2.5 score, they were overjoyed. And I said to them, did you really come in here to my boss and say, we want you to pay us $5 million a year and we're going to do a mediocre job? And I said, I don't think so. You probably came in here promising me you were going to be up here. So the fact that you're here, I don't think is worth $5 million a year. I would expect you to be here. What could they say? They had to agree. And then what we did, and I'm just going to go to this quickly, then what we did is we started to use this as a roadmap to fix that. What that simplifies to me is this whole cycle. That's what you're doing from start to finish. And what you find is the stuff that you're looking at is what I call the gaps between the major processes and the next process or gateway. And what you're going to find in a lot of companies is these are all air gaps. And what I mean by air gaps is they're manual interfaces where people take something from one gateway and throw it to the next one. And nine times out of 10, it's usually not fit for purpose in the next gateway anyway. Because what should be happening in a gateway process is you're maturing the detail and the knowledge about the programs. How many times have you started a project before you've actually finished the design? The gateway is supposed to do that. You're not supposed to start production until you know what you've designed. Nine times out of 10, the gateway doesn't, because it's so porous, people blow through it as a, just a tick list. I'm ready to start. So my point is, each one of these major gateways have gaps. And what's supposed to happen, and let's just take the work order gap, and let me explain it. First time I went and looked at a problem with work orders, they said, you know what the problem is, Patrick? We need more people doing work orders because it takes weeks to do work orders. We need to throw three or four more people at it so we can churn these work orders out. I thought, well, that sounds odd. Went and looked at it. The work order person told me, the reason it takes me three weeks to do a work order is because I get two lines to spend a work order to a client for three million. I can't physically type a work order with the amount of scope that they give me. There'd be nothing for the contractor to say what I'm going to do. It simply says, build a powerhouse, build a road. I need a lot more detail to put a work order out to have Patrick than I get. And I said, well, actually, you should be getting the detail from here. We should have approved the design. You should know everything you need to know about the work order. But they didn't. And this is what I mean by an air gap. What was happening here wasn't actually making life easier there at all. There was a huge gap between what the process said it was going to do than what was actually delivered into the next gateway phase. And then what happens is everything starts to slam against each other because the date the contract starts probably doesn't change. The date that you have to deliver the work probably doesn't change. But you're still in design when you should have been in production. So. And just take one more. Budget and forecasting, that's always a good one. I, I, I really love that one. Uh, one of my clients that I was with, when I first started, their budget forecast was 30% out. 
So they would plan to spend X, and each month they were at least 30% out. And when I first heard that number, I said, that sounds more like a game show than it does a forecast. Anybody off the street can predict something, I think, within 30%, even if you don't know it. I reckon I could predict how much it costs to launch something to the moon within 30%, because I've read enough papers about it. So what I found out was happening, if you trace this back, this wasn't working. We were forecasting on immature scope, and what's the first thing a contractor does when you can't tell him what you want him to do? He hedges, he doesn't say, well, I can't do the work because you don't know what you want done. He'll just add a bunch of money to it to cover what you didn't tell him. He'll take 30, 40%, whack it in there and go, okay, I can do it for that because I can do anything for that kind of money. And what then happens is your forecasting goes off because then when you actually do it, he goes, oh, that's what you wanted done. Oh, I can do that for half of that. And then your forecasting is out. So it goes back to what I'm saying about looking at the real problems rather than the symptoms of the problem. Forecasting errors, unable to actually uh, add maturity through the gateway process, usually means that you've got a process that you're not enforcing somewhere. And that's what I want to talk about. I wanted to lead you to this point to convince you that there's actually a problem in here. This is where the problem lies. Changes. Just take one more because some of you don't look convinced. Change control. Everyone says they do it. Everyone says they have it. I had a client, started out at 50 million, over a year, added another 20 million. The schedule never changed once. How can you add 20 million to a 50 million pound program and no one added one resource to the schedule? And guess what happened? All of a sudden, the work that was already underway started to fall off. And the reason was they were pulling people off the job they were doing perfectly fine with to now start the new work that they never got any new people in to do. And then the whole program started to suffer. I said, well, where was the change control? Oh, we changed the contract. So what they had done with change control is they changed the contract, but no one had actually tracked the change back through the forecast and back through the schedule. They had never changed the forecast, never added any more activities to the schedule, never added any more resources to the schedule. And then lo and behold, it all starts to come apart. I can give you a practical example for every one of these where you probably have a process, but you haven't tied it up with an actual tool set that delivers the value into the program. And this brings me to this. This is my example on how to do it right. Speed cameras have the right idea. If you're a program controls professional and you're saying, okay, Patrick, I'm gonna assume I've got all those problems. Give me something I can use. How do I fix it? I'm gonna tell you how to fix it. And this absolutely works. Every time you're thinking of designing a system or a process, think about the speed camera. And here's what I'm gonna say to you. Procedure. The government decides, you know what? We're killing too many people on the roads. Reducing the speed is a way to save lives. We need the hearts and minds of the average man. So you look like a reasonable man. I explain it to you. You go, you know what, Patrick? I'm going to slow down because I'm that kind of guy. You don't look unreasonable, but I'm going to cast you in that light. You think, you know what? I think that's all a bit about a hokum, Patrick. I'm going to still go as fast as my car will take me. My idea is that by just explaining something in hearts and minds, you'll probably get 10% of the people to do what you want them to do. Change control is no different. You'll come out with a procedure, you'll get people in, you'll explain that you need to control costs across the baseline, you'll explain that you need to report this to your shareholders, to your board members, you'll explain that if you don't do the change control, the schedule becomes obsolete, you're spending all this money for nothing, come on guys, help us out. 10% of the people will go along with you. That's my view. The other 90% will do exactly what they did before. So. Speed cameras, they thought, you know what? We've done the advertisements, we've done the hearts and minds. Now we're gonna put cameras on the side of the road that make it easier for me to catch you speeding than it does for you to get me to catch you speeding. Because they can sit in their office, they put the speed camera on the side of the road, it flashes you and they get their money. Now, 70% of the people won't speed because you've enforced your procedure in a way that's less 
cumbersome on you and more cumbersome on them. So you've got 80% of the people not speeding because you've tied the procedure and the hearts and minds around what you want to do to something that actually brings it into the real world. If you speed, the camera will flash, you will get a ticket. And the last thing is the ticket itself because you have to have consequences. If there's no consequences, people still, that the hardcore will think, you know what, that doesn't apply to me. Change control doesn't apply to me. Schedule change doesn't apply to me. Budget forecasting doesn't apply to me. I'm the program director, I can spend what I like. You have to have consequences within your system that alerts people that you're not following this. What would be the consequences in a program control system for me? KPIs. When I've done this, what I've done, and I'll just take a real world example, and I've got one for you as well, but I used to prepare a report. Now, a report didn't say the program managers were terrible people because they would have came for me in the dark. But what I did was I used non threatening words in a report and a KPI to the program director. And I said things like, unable to produce a, consolida a consolidated report because this guy did not produce his data in time. Yeah, no, everyone else did, but this guy here did not give me his data at the time that I needed to compile that report. And that's all I said. You would be surprised how many people did not want me to say that to report for the NPR, monthly program review. So the consequences can be you saying to someone via a KPI or some mechanism that you're monitoring your process, how many people are actually doing it and how many people are not. That alone will get people to do it. But if you're doing some work and no one is looking at the KPIs of the work you're doing, then that means nobody cares. Until you produce a KPI that someone looks at each month that you can say, this is how we're performing, you have no mechanism to influence anybody to do anything in program controls. They will not play a blind bit of difference to you. So these are the three things you need to do. Do your procedures by all means. Do your hearts and minds by all means. But you should always be thinking, if I'm saying this is how we're going to do scheduling, how am I actually going to get people to do that? What's the mechanism? What if they say, so what? I'm not going to do it, Patrick. And here's something else. I am not a fan of big bang anything. I've never seen it work. Most people, when they're trying to put together a program control procedures, will spend hours and hours and hours and hours trying to design the perfect change control, trying to provide the perfect risk, trying to design the perfect whatever. You don't really have to. What you should do, if you've done it this way, the next thing you need to do is you've assessed your capability using a maturity matrix, you've defined your requirements, you make the tactical change to implement the program control, and then what you do is increment that change until you get to where you want to be. 75% is really good. You, I've been here 10 years. You know how many good program control systems I've seen in some of the, the major companies in the UK? Probably two. I seriously mean that. In 10 years, I've probably seen two program control systems that are probably worth their salt. Mostly because of this. They start out trying to solve world hunger. They implement something. It doesn't solve world hunger. Everyone gets disillusioned, and they walk away saying earned value doesn't work. Scheduling doesn't work. You're much better starting here. Figure out where you're at on the maturity matrix. Because you might be solving a problem you don't need to solve. Once you figure out where you're at on the maturity matrix, figure out where you want to be. What are the requirements that get you there? Make a tactical change to do it. And then because you're watching KPIs and you're monitoring what you're doing, slowly change the KPIs back into the procedure until you actually achieve the desired results. It's a much better way to achieve what you want to achieve. And you can use this on almost any program control you care to name. Let me just take one for you, risk. I had a client that says, you know what? Matter of fact, all my clients say this about risk. We do risk, Patrick, but all my risk winds up slushing to the back of the program. I can't get the program managers to give it back. 
they keep changing it and changing it. It's like chasing a mouse. And then four weeks before the end of the program, someone comes and dumps 10 million on the desk and go, yep, didn't need this. Anybody here ever had that problem? Here's how you solve it. To really solve it, you should have programmed risk properly into the program when you started, but that never happens. What you then do and what we did was we just did a very simple thing. And actually, I'll use my speed camera. We came up with a procedure that said, all right, guys, we want 75% of your risk to have a start date and an end date. That's all I want. Don't care about anything else. Just go through all the risks, 75% of them, give me a start date, give me an end date. Then you program that in, and you did a, a waterfall chart. Then we said, and what we're going to do then is baseline that waterfall chart against each one of you. And when you hit the end date of that risk, we will automatically retire the money. We want to ask you to give the money back. We will automatically retire the money because it's your baseline and you said that's the end date. And then we reverse the procedure to say if you don't want us to take the risk money against your own baseline of a start and finish date, you must request that prior to the finish date being achieved. We then